I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Wrote Maverick editor Brody Spencer, the cadet today is going to fight. This war strikes him not as a lark, but as a dirty job that must be done. And done it was. By midterm 1942, as many as 29 cadets were inducted. All college freshmen in advanced military service were told to report for duty by June 15, 1943. That class sent 250 young men. Several faculty were called to active duty. Major Plummer, longtime boxing coach. Corey Woodbury, who would become highly decorated. And Captain F.B. Howden, who would later die as a POW in Bataan. No new cadets were to be matriculated who would become 18 during the first semester. The Corps leaders were two years younger than usual. Troops D, H, L, and M were temporarily discontinued. Some wondered if the Corps would disappear. Varsity football was dropped. During those years, final balls could be very final. The aging Superintendent Pearson wrote hundreds of letters uniting his boys and their parents comforting them whenever he could, often grieving. Cadets would serve their country well. Their contribution to the war would bring great credit to NMMI. Cadets were on Corregidor and would make the Bataan Death March. Fighter pilots in Midway, tankers with Patton, infantry at the Battle of the Bulge, Navy in the Coral Sea. One report stated 2,868 former cadets went to war. 57 cadets had seen service in both world wars. 1,735 served as officers. 170 were killed. 526 received citations and awards. 201 Purple Hearts, 86 Silver Stars, 16 Distinguished Service Crosses, one Congressional Medal of Honor. And then it was finally over. The 1943 commencement speaker had told the Corps that isolation was now as dead as the buffalo. The 1945 address asserted the old world had ended with Hiroshima. Lusk Hall was finished. Major R.L. Bates retired as commissary officer. In the fall of 1946, Superintendent Pearson was pleased to welcome 200 cadets to the junior college. About 20 were former cadets who had been GIs. But the regents asserted no relaxation of academic or disciplinary standards. All cadets must be unmarried and live in the barracks. All must abide by the rules. The GI cadets did just that. Heroism wasn't limited to things military. F.H. Larry and B.H. Cobb, son of Ty Cobb, the great baseball player, were cited for saving a drowning student. Chapel was conducted in Pearson Auditorium. Reverend Kryle would conduct chapel. O. Tracy Kelly would serve two years as regimental commander. Athletics moved to the popular tune of Buckle Down, Winsaki, Buckle Down. And true to form, the Bronco did buck. Varsity football came back with a bang. The rifle teams crackled with success. Boxing boomed. Baseball bats cracked the balls through the air on a new diamond. The Broncos buckled down to success. Swing was the thing, and post-war cadets did swing. In 1949, an affiliate of the Radio Corporation of America even recorded a rousing rendition of The Old Post and the NMMI March. Gene Autry filmed the movie Sons of New Mexico at NMMI. Cadets performed in cavalry units and individual roles. Ruby Pose put her special magic in the post exchange with music, dances, and her own style of counseling. Ted Hunt, class of 18, the first secretary of the Alumni Association, organized alumni chapters in 25 cities and on five college campuses, made plans for annual class reunions at homecoming, awarded scholarships, and published the Sally Port every six weeks. Paul Horgan returned as assistant to the superintendent. Cap Brown, longtime coach and athletic director, died, and coach Babe Godfrey became athletic director. 
the look of the core changed. Slacks replaced breeches, boots, and putties. Cadets began wearing the Bronco shoulder patch. The Corps experienced other changes. Colonel H.P. Saunders, commandant for 30 years, passed away in 1947. Thomas B. Stapp took his place, and Seth Orell, a former cadet and longtime TAC, became his assistant. The retirement of Superintendent Pearson, after 22 years, ended the VMI era, an era which had begun in 1898. Most of the buildings on campus now were built during Colonel Pearson's era. Wilson Hall, Cahoon Armory, the residences for the superintendent, the deputy superintendent, the commandant, J. Ross Thomas, the stables, three faculty houses off campus, a third Lee Hall, and Pearson Auditorium. The departure of both Colonel Saunders and Pearson created a vacuum difficult to fill but it also provided an opportunity to chart a new course for the school on the hill. And so while Harry S. Truman was stopping the buck and giving him hell from the Oval Office, and the senator from Wisconsin, Joe McCarthy, was looking in corners for commies, at NMMI, things, they were a-changing. With the full endorsement of Colonel Pearson, the Board of Regents elected the 50-year-old Hugh Milton as NMMI's sixth CEO. Milton, a student in the sciences and holder of several honorary doctorates, as well as a military man who had risen to the rank of general, believed the changing world needed men of vision in government and public service. Milton questioned whether a military school could meet the demands of the day. A successful school would prepare people who could serve the public. NMMI, he believed, could become a small specialized college stressing preparation for that service, a college on the level with Princeton. Dartmouth, Amherst, a four-year college. In just three short years, this dynamic superintendent won greater academic recognition for NMMI. NMMI received the NCA accreditation as a senior college in March 1951 by the same men who had evaluated NMMI as a junior college back in 1938. In April of 50, the first cadets graduated with bachelor degrees. In a March 1951 letter, the War Department requested the Regents release General Milton so that he might become the Executive Officer for Reserve and ROTC Affairs in New Mexico. June 25, 1950, North Korea sent tanks into South Korea. Once again, NMMI did its part in this national emergency. The Faculty Senate recorded its willingness to put the entire facilities of the school at the disposal of the government and it recommended giving full credit to those students inducted after nine weeks. Institute men who were reserve officers were ordered to active duty. In all, 10 cadets would die. Colonel Tom B. Hall, class of 30, was the senior cadet to be killed. Cadets gave 80% of the blood collected during the Korean War blood drives in Roswell. On August 15, 1951, shortly after Milton left, NMMI became one of 10 full-fledged four-year military colleges, retaining its military status for high school. But the senior college, which existed from 1950 to 1956, with 188 cadets earning bachelor's degrees, did not endure. After Milton left, math teacher Ewing L. Lusk became acting president. Lusk and others, reflecting the sentiments of many local alumni, believed that a four-year liberal arts college was essentially incompatible with a military school. Then NMMI entered a period of unprecedented turmoil and confusion in its attempt to redefine mission and to regain the right course. In 1952, a history teacher, the high school principal, succeeded Superintendent Lusk, Charles F. Ward. The regents, familiar with Ward, stated that his familiarity with and confidence in the school's traditions and methods augured well for future progress. Former cadet Frank King, class of 44, a Rhodes Scholar, would return to teach economics and philosophy. He would leave a few years later, only to return again as the first faculty chair in 1990. The next three years, however, proved to be tumultuous. One of the auguries proved tragic. On final ball night of 1954, Three cadets drowned in the swimming pool of Luna Natatorium, Virtus of Roswell, Moore of Riodosa, and Volopolis of Houston. V.M.V. V. Hall is named in their memory. A year later, on March 25, 1955, 
tap sounded for the senior college at NMMI. Cadets reacted to the news with fire hoses and the temporary takeover of Hagerman. The faculty, alumni, and parents made no protest. Thus, the senior college was dissolved as quickly as it had been created. Another unsettling event on campus was the elimination of polo, ironically, at a time when the Institute teams of 52 and 54 took the national title away from Princeton and Yale. The regents, reflecting economic pressure, however, had voted not to spend $1,800 to repair a dozen English saddles. And after much debate between the regents and alumni, the governing body disbanded the sport. Many expressed dismay at its loss. In 1953, Wayne Laverty would win the National Golden Gloves Championship. On a state level, the Institute was quite proud of both candidates in the gubernatorial race of 1954. They were Democrat John F. Sims and Republican H. O. Bursum, both ex-cadets. While the country hunted communists with a vengeance, the region sought a leader who would take control. Lieutenant General Hobart Gay was elected ninth superintendent of NMMI in June of 1955. The regents voted to give him complete authority to run the school within established policies, including hiring and firing. Born May 16, 1894, partially blinded by a polo shot in 1922, General Gay served in World War II and Korea. He was General Patton's chief of staff and strategist. Hobart Gay was all military apparent in his words. Management of an educational institution is very similar to the duties of commanding an army and apparent in his actions. His first official action was to hire retired General John P. Willie as commandant. They both tightened discipline. Ten alumni would be members of the faculty and staff. With Gay's arrival, student publication declined. The Gary Owen combined with Maverick. The days of voicing criticism were gone. But a serious riot took place in March of 1956, the first of two riots during the general's tenure. With swagger stick in hand, General Gay often walked through halls of academic buildings during class hours, as well as on the football field, giving training tips to the coaches. Gay recommended restricting sports to students with a 2.5 average or better. He initiated Saturday and Sunday afternoon study halls. It was a great era for sports. From 55 to 59, Bronco football never had a losing season, going undefeated in 1959 with cadet All-Americans Joe Hernandez, Marshall Pizintowski, Roger Sawyers, who was later killed in Vietnam, and Ken Willis. During Superintendent Gay's eight years, college enrollment grew from 150 to 328 cadets. A patron donated 50 Carillon Bells in memory of Colonel Saunders. Shoulder boards replaced stripes. Cadets voted to have their heavy meal at supper rather than at noon. The foreign language lab received sound equipment for 24 students. The first associate in arts degrees were awarded. Cadets initiated an annual talent variety show. The regents banned drumming a dismissed cadet out of the corps. The administration building was air conditioned. The superintendent quietly spoke of eliminating the old cadet, new cadet system. NMMI hosted multi-school debates. John Kennedy defeated Richard Nixon by a small margin. Pacifists picketed the school, and people began wondering what was going on in Birmingham, Selma, and Saigon. Quietly, Miss Myrtle Decker, Spanish teacher for 30 years and known for her many cats and not being able to get her car out of first gear, died. In the summer of 62, Colonel James R. Kelly, the college dean, died. He had been at NMMI for 38 years. Old timers were sorry to see the tough old soldier Hobart Gay leave the hill in 1963. But the arrival of the 10th superintendent brought a leader to the institute who was also an ex-cadet. Another tough soldier, Major General Sam Agee, had been a cadet in 1929, but left in 31 for West Point. The objective of the course of instruction is not to send out into the world a perfect soldier full-fledged, but to give the student a sure foundation theoretically and practically so that he can make of himself what he may be capable of, to inspire him with a desire to increase his knowledge and, above all, to imbue him with that love of truth and honesty which will cause him to hold his good name above all that the world has to offer. In March of 63, the Corps met in Pearson Auditorium where they threw their rank down. 
The spokesman, Regimental Commander Tom K. Kelly, demanded restoration of intramurals, more hours of operation for the post exchange, more cadet dances, and permission to enforce cadet discipline. Two of the demands were met, but Kelly was demoted. For the first time in NMMI history, not only was the superintendent an ex-cadet, but also were the PMS, Colonel Buck Wiles, and the Commandant, Colonel Ned Vaughn. Together, they brought to the Corps a new sense of freedom. The early 60s would also see the retirement of John Cost, J. Brian Ellis, Charles Whitney, Dwight Starr, Harry Blake Sr., and Alfred Carter. All had taught at NMMI since the 20s. During this time of the Beatles and the Mamas and the Papas, the old cadet, new cadet system would remain unchanged. But physical hazing became a reason for dismissal. Positive cadet leadership was encouraged, and academics were stressed. Most of the college cadets bunked in the newly completed Saunders barracks. The black and red jacket replaced the long overcoat, and short sleeve shirts replaced the long sleeve in warm weather. One cadet publication stated the Corps was finally getting a fair shake. In 1965, 950 cadets enrolled from 43 states and 17 foreign countries. The infirmary was dedicated to I.J. Marshall, and five years later, the library to Paul Horgan. The Corps remained a politically conservative one in support of the military action in Vietnam. The recall stated that 66% of the Corps felt the draft was fair. One cadet stated that draft card burning was an indication of moral decay. The war in the Far East, however, seemed like a world away, as cadets accepted annual dance invitations from the El Paso Radford School for Girls and attended the tea dances at VMV as a way to meet Roswell girls. The Institute celebrated its Diamond Jubilee at homecoming. But the most invigorating event for a 75-year-old school occurred with the enrollment of a single cadet, Edward Colbert, the first black cadet. A quiet fellow who liked music, who as a cadet played with the Roswell Symphony Orchestra. Colbert entered the top 10% of his class in September of 1966 and graduated two years later with honors. Yes, in its 75th year, New Mexico Military Institute, a school influenced by Southern men, socially and politically conservative, had turned another corner. But the road ahead was to be far from smooth. NMMI was moving down a very difficult road, one paved with increasingly hostile feelings toward the military and military institutions. Again, New Mexico Military Institute would be forced to redefine its purpose.